You're listening to the Angry Marks Pro Wrestling Show on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. He is not only a star, he is a star maker, and his services are constantly in demand. So without further ado, let me introduce the star of Ohio Valley Wrestling announcing the star of his own podcast, The Bowling Alley, the star maker, Kenny Bowling. Well, I'll tell you what, that's about ten times better in introductions than Rob Dickless Dickin gave me over at the Ant, uh, the first show that we did for the first Bowling Alley. He botched that thing so bad I had to make him do it twice. Fortunately, we won't have to make you do that tonight. That was that was a that was a uh, an above average introduction, if I ever heard one. Well, we strive to be above average at the Angry Barks podcast, so we graciously accept that compliment, especially from the star maker. Because without you, so many people in Ohio Valley wouldn't be where they are today. I don't even know if there'd be an Ohio Valley without me today. I've been uh, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes uh, for the last fifteen years. And you name it, and I have done it. I, I don't care if it's advertising, promotions, management, uh, the counseling, you name it. I've been involved in it in one fashion or the other. Let's start right there, as a matter of fact. Tell us how you uh, first got into the professional wrestling scene, what led you to Ohio Valley. Get, give our listeners the background on what got you your start. Well, I'll tell you what, what led me to professional wrestling is I became a, I was always a bit of a fan. I mean, me and my my stepdad and my grandpa Bowling, we all, we always watched pro wrestling from the time I was five or six years old. And I had a, um, an above average interest in it. But when Jerry the King Lawler came aboard, uh, around 1972 is when I really got hooked on pro wrestling. I mean, I just, I was fascinated by this man's work. And but let, let, let's, let's face facts. There was no angry marks. There were no, I don't even know if there was the term marks back then. And um, people just were nowhere near as smart to the business as they were then. And, yeah, your my mother would sit there and tell you how fake it is. And then my dad would know it's all real and, and all this stuff. And I was sitting there like, well, whatever it is, I'm thoroughly entertained by this. And uh, Jerry Lawler was the one who entertained me the best. And from 72, 73, 74, he just lured me in. I was thinking, good God, this is what I want to do. But I don't, I don't know if I want to take that ass whipping he takes every week. And if you'll remember, Jerry Lawler was the first one, um, who had a manager that didn't talk. Sam Bass hardly ever said a word. He was just there to interfere and still got more heat than almost any manager in the history of wrestling in the Mid South. They can say what they want about Jimmy Cornette, Jimmy Hart. All of them had plenty of heat. All of them were well hated. But Sam Bass, for a guy that almost never said a word, was a hated son of a bitch. And I always thought to myself, boy, I would be the, you know, I was 10 years younger than Jerry Lawler when I was, you know, 12, he was 22. And I, but I always thought, well, I would be the perfect manager for him because even at 12 years of age, I felt that I was a pretty good talker. And uh, we actually had some stuff we could work with. And then, of course, my main claim to fame, John Cena. Uh, actually, was there in, uh, in Kentucky the other day and I heard that the, some interviewers had talked to him about me and, but he was very complimentary about what I'd done for his career. So that, that was nice to hear. Cena had nothing but praise for uh, how Bowen Services got him to be in WWE. So you, you do deserve a lot of credit for that and helping a young superstar who was coming in as a prototype and hadn't really been formed into anything yet. If you've ever seen the DVD My Life that me and Danny Davis are on there uh, for a little bit, giving our two cents worth about Cena, you'll see Vince McMahon say that I didn't think Cena had it in him. I didn't think he had any talent. I didn't think he'd make it in the WWE, and me and Danny Davis and Jim Cornette are like, you got to be fucking me. You know what are you talking about? This guy can't make it, and so I don't know what I don't know what Vince was looking at, but uh, he, he he blew it on that because uh, Cena, and then of course Rico Constantino was here right about that same time. He went up he went up before Cena did. Uh, very talented individuals, and Rico Constantino ought to still be with the company today if you ask me. He was a superior talent and was a great heat getter as well. I would totally agree with you. In fact, I, I from the very beginning when Rico showed up, I was already familiar with him from his uh, work on American Gladiators, and I thought, this guy has oh, yeah. charisma. He's an athlete. He's going to go really far. And and then he ended up managing Billy and Chuck and being in a couple of tag teams, and it just seemed like they never got out of him what they really could. Uh, oh, no, no. And and he even gave me credit for all the heat that he that he had on there. Well, the, see, but Billy, 
I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, Billy uh, and Chuck, they they seemed to work well with him. But when he had uh, Holly involved, Holly Holly did not like Rico. Holly Holly made it clear that Rico got way too much heat and took too much attention away from them. Which I, I've even been accused of that at OVW. But Rico knew and Cena knew that if I had heat, the group had heat, and you can absorb what what I have done. And smart wrestlers and smart people in the business know that. I mean. How, how much heat do you think Cornette had? Did you ever hear Bobby and Dennis complain about how much heat Jimmy had? They better pray to fucking God Jimmy had the heat because D- Dennis and Bobby, uh, their strong point was not promos. Jimmy was the absolute perfect manager for them. I sometimes wondered why I had Cena because Cena was such a good talker, but we all three knew our place. We all three could talk. Rico will admit to you he was probably the lesser of the three of us, but he got better just through association, and he got to be pretty damn good. And But all three of us knew our place. None of the three of us were jealous of who got the most promo time. And obviously, you couldn't have me managing and not have Cena cut promos because that's what his specialty is. He was a better promo cutter than he was a wrestler and probably still is. And WWE has not got the max out of Cena yet. If you've ever seen him be a heel here at LVW, uh, he's got talent that you all haven't seen yet. And maybe eventually they'll smarten up and not worry about T-shirt sales and let him do what he does best. Oh, y'all just really trying to get me going tonight, are <laughs> Paul Heyman, uh, actually, me and Paul, personally, got along fine. He claimed he was a big fan of Kenny Bowen and all this bullshit, same shit he tells everybody else. And uh, we got along fine. But when he got here to Louisville, the thing you got to remember, and I'm, I'm well uh, documented for saying this, is that ECW was a fucking bullshit company in Philadelphia that had 772 core fans that would follow them anywhere. And they could go all over the Northeast and stay above the Dixon, the Mason-Dixon line, and those 772 would follow them anywhere they would go for most of the time, as long as they had money from their mother and could cash in their pop bottles and were allowed to leave the basement on that uh, said day. And a few other maybe 100 or two fans would join them in said town that they would go to, and they'd get a crowd of anywhere from... 300 minimum to uh, maybe uh, 1,500 max or uh, maybe not even that many. They, they had a few in Philly that did better than that. And that core audience loved them to death. They loved that violent shit. They loved the chairs on fire. They loved all the blood. They loved the, psych- the psychopath bullshit matches they'd have. And that was fine for them. But in the Mid-South, see, they would only get a match like that once every three to six months. Because when you only saw it one every three to six months, it meant something. Holy shit, that guy bled. Ain't nobody bled on Memphis TV in six months. Well, at, at, at ECW, someone bleeds every six months. And he, he uh, come down here with that booking mentality to OVW and some of the ridiculous storylines and all the shit that the Philadelphia market would eat up. But it wasn't going to work here. And we tried to explain to him it wasn't going to work here. And in the six months he was here, we lost way over half of our TV audience. They just said, fuck this shit, we ain't coming no more. And and they told us that. And it got to the point where I had to quit because he kept trying to give Ken Doan my company, and Ken Doan was going to cut my promos for me while I stood in the background. And I said, well, to be such a fan of mine and to love my work, well, Kenny, i got to get this WWE talent over. You know, we're, we're trying to get them up and pay them, not you. And uh, I'm not going to have anybody come in here and, and, and take over my fucking company for me at your direction, especially when it's not capable of doing so. And Ken Doan is not capable. So I'll tell you what, you shove Ken Doan up your ass. I love Bobby Lashley. You're probably going to fuck him up too, but keep Bobby Lashley. And you can take the whole kit and caboodle of him, and I'm going to go home because eventually WWE is going to get sick of your shit and you're going to be gone too.